World War Z, an oral history of the zombie war. It goes by many names, the Crisis, the Dark Years, or the Walking Plague. And whilst it's been some years since victory was declared, the effects are still present across much of the globe. Global life expectancy is a mere fraction of what it was in pre-war times, and mass pollution blights the world with malnutrition and the rise of previously eradicated pathogens. Even countries like the United States, that developed post-war universal healthcare and a resurgent economy, still suffer. The wounds, both physical and mental, inflicted upon the globe are simply too deep to be healed in just 12 years. But what's the story? Both of the events that occurred, the people who did and didn't survive it, and the living dead that caused it. Join me as we explore the events of World War Z. The first tale comes from China. With a population now of just 50,000, and most attention going to rebuilding the coastal cities, the more rural areas barely have electricity or running water. But the streets are clear, and the Security Council has prevented any further outbreaks. Its chairman, Kuang Jingshu, is old and injured and busy, but is still a doctor above all else. He became one to help those around him, and unlike many colleagues who just did it for the money, he still believes it is our duty to hold ourselves responsible to the people. It was this attitude that found him bouncing over a dirt road on the way to New Dakang. Old Dakang was one of the thousands of villages displaced by the creation of the Three Gorges Dam. A creation that when flooded, forced millions to move closer to urban areas like Chongqing. But like many of the displaced, the residents weren't wealthy, and many who moved still had to rely on savings they didn't have. So the residents of Dakang simply built a second hamlet by hand, not so far from the waters of the dam. Naturally helpful as he may be, Jing Shu isn't thrilled to be so far out in the middle of nowhere, and is hoping this call is actually going to be serious. Unfortunately, he has no idea how serious this was going to be. Upon arrival, the doctor finds he has seven patients, all with the same symptoms. Lack of coherency, chills, and a high fever. And oddly, all with bite marks. When asked, the villagers claim they came from their patient zero. Jing Shu finds him isolated in his own building, a boy of twelve gagged and hogtied and covered in bloodless wounds. His skin is as cold as the cement he lies on, and Jing Shu can't find a pulse or a heartbeat. All through his examination, he snarls through his gag, and when forcibly restrained, he snaps one of his own arms trying to get at his assailants. After taking blood and sealing the door, his mother explains he was wounded moonfishing a term for diving to the sunken ruins for treasures still left in the old villages. In this case, their own heirlooms from old Dakang. The boy's father never made it back to the surface. Jing Shu calls an old army colleague from Zhongqing University, Dr. Gu Wenkui. After getting their pleasantries out of the way, he shows him the bites and the symptoms of the new patients. After seeing them, the normally more jovial Dr. Quay robotically reads a set of instructions. Stay where you are. Take the names of all who have had contact with the infected. Restrain those already infected. If any have passed into a coma, vacate the room and secure the exit. And finally, are you armed? Dr. Quay then tells him he should expect support in a few hours. But when it arrives, it's the renamed former Ministry of State Security, and not the Ministry of Health as they claim to be. The seven patients are gagged, tied, and taken away on stretchers, the boy in a body bag. The rest of the villagers are stripped, examined, and photographed for bites. The thing that disturbs Jing Shu most is something his old colleague said. Dr. Quay was an obligate pessimist. Every headache a brain tumour, every dark cloud an incoming flood. Back in 1969, when they were two army doctors treating those wounded in border clashes with the Soviet Union, they had to shield a patient from falling debris caused by an air raid with their own bodies as the enemy encroached. Their situation couldn't be worse. And under the great pressure, Dr. Quay told him the last thing he expected to hear. Don't worry, everything's going to be alright. Things were so bad, there was no more room left for pessimism. 
he could only start to head in the opposite direction. After the query on whether or not he was armed, Jing Shu asked if he should be worried. Dr. Kui's response said it all. Don't worry, everything's going to be alright. It dawns on Jing Shu this is not the first nor an isolated outbreak. He had just enough time to call his daughter and tell her to leave the country with his granddaughter, and to feed her the same lie Dr. Kui fed him. In Tibet, its capital city of Lhasa is now the world's most populous city, and with its high altitude, is one of the safest too. We meet Nyori Televaldi amidst the celebrations after a successful election for the Social Democrat Party. Prior to the outbreak, Televaldi lived in Kashi, India, and worked as what he generously refers to as a smuggler, when human trafficker is probably the more accurate term, among other things into ex-Soviet countries from places like Thailand and Myanmar, which he unapologetically refers to as primitive excuses for countries. But all that quickly began to change as more outbreaks popped up. Urban professionals, skilled labourers, and even low-level government employees all began to demand Televaldi's services in their desperation to flee. Televaldi is just the first of many vultures to descend in the early stages of the upheaval, and such stages were repeatedly marked by people either failing or refusing to understand what was truly going on. For some, this just looked like another opportunity to profit off others. 90% of human traffic came through Kashi, making Televaldi and numerous government officials very rich indeed, even dabbling in some air cargo for the high rollers. As time passes, the demographics start to change, and there are fewer and fewer people fleeing what's coming, and more and more people who had already been bitten, believing the myth that the West had a miracle cure. A myth and an idea some other businesses of similar morality would only be too happy to capitalise on with later developments. As things got worse, more and more roundabout routes had to be taken. As the smugglers crassly said, Every rich man's house has a servant's entrance. Those wishing to flee to Western Europe now had to travel through the East, and for the US, you could go via Mexico. And the infected became more and more prevalent in the personnel. Many people could be seen with something squirming under blankets in the back seat of a car, or hear something banging in its boot. Some even had crates with air holes for their turned loved ones, still completely ignorant of what had happened to them. Even worse, in sea smuggling, there was a risk the entire hold would get infected, and captains would pull up to deserted stretches of coast to unload their entire cargo, or even dump them at sea, only contributing to further outbreaks and spreading the plague. Televaldi's final job occurred as it began to dawn on him at last that all the money he was making may not be good for much longer. An investment banker from Xi'an had acquired enough money to smuggle his entire extended family, all of whom could be heard banging and moaning in the back of the van, already turned. Seemingly so many, the van itself was shaking back and forth. Even the wealthy higher classes were fleeing now, and the amount of infected getting smuggled across was untenable, making those like Televaldi key players in the virus's success and spread across the globe. Kyrgyzstan was one such country many try to flee into, and while speaking with Canadian veteran Stanley MacDonald in the stronghold monasteries of Meteora in Greece, we found out what went down in Central Europe as a result of men like Televaldi. MacDonald and co. were deployed in what was meant to be a standard drug-busting mission there, long before any official outbreaks had occurred. As such, only the local muscle of drug and gun runners was expected. Tracking them seemed easy. A local firefight had left a blood trail leading to their abandoned pack mules, which, oddly, had been partially eaten. But this wasn't too big a surprise. Packs of feral dogs roamed their crags and valleys, and a wagon train of mules would make for a welcome meal. What was less explainable was the fact that the illegal contraband worth tens of thousands was left untouched. The trail led MacDonald and co. up the mountain, following the tracks of someone who had seemingly collapsed face down, before rising again to stumble up the same trail they were on. Upon finding the cave the traders had been using to stash their gear, they uncover bodies of men who had seemingly run straight into their own booby traps trying to flee. Entering, the walls of the cave were peppered with gunfire, 
and apparently gnawed remains of the combatants within. Each chamber was the same. Smashed barricades, signs of a firefight, and considerable blood trails. The final chamber had collapsed completely from an explosion, with just a hand remaining sticking from the rubble, and still moving. Instinctively, MacDonald grabbed it to pull them out, and it almost crushed his fingers gripping back so strong. Trying to pull free, MacDonald dragged them from the rubble, as they refused to let go, and on getting free, tried to pull his arm into their snapping mouth. MacDonald dropped his assailant, but is the only witness. Back in Edmonton, he gets labelled with exposure to unknown chemical agents, and PTSD. The treatment is long-term rest and evaluation. MacDonald willingly accepted it, and to what he's told. At the time, it seemed better than what the alternative was, and ultimately, what the truth was too. Adapting to the plague by developing villages suspended from the rainforest canopy, the indigenous Yanomami people in Brazil have weathered the outbreak better than most, and it's unclear what their relationship with Fernando Oliveira is, who is one of many who profited, albeit perhaps a lot less consciously, from the early days of the uprising. Living in Rio de Janeiro, Oliveira worked as a doctor, and he remains adamant about that. One could make the argument doing organ transplants from the black market was illegal. He preferred to argue that he was still saving lives and doing moral good. And if the global north was so opposed, then why did their citizens keep showing up for them? Whether or not their money paid for Oliviera's lifestyle was immaterial, he thought. At the time, Oliviera had just got a heart in. Compared to skin or liver or kidneys, hearts were hard to get, and not just any heart either but one with dextrocardia, where the organs lie on the opposite side of the body to usual. So one could almost describe his patient, Herr Muller, as lucky. Almost, if not for the fact that he wasn't waking up from anesthesia. None of his vital signs were looking very positive either, although Oliviera's more experienced colleague, Dr. Silva, told him that this was only normal for an unhealthy, overweight man in his late 60s, after one of the most invasive procedures in medicine. With his superior saying he'll stay behind and keep an eye on things, Oliviera goes out to get smashed with how worried he is, although his concerns are justified when he gets a call from his receptionist, saying that Herr Muller has fallen into a coma. Rushing back to the hospital, he finds out that Dr. Silver was trying to revive Muller, when he woke up and bit him on the hand. The nurse telling him this tried to help, but was almost bitten herself before she fled. Arming himself, Oliviera enters the surgery, and finds Muller in the process of seemingly eating Dr. Silva. As Muller shows the same interest in him, Oliviera manages a lucky headshot and calls the police. Dr. Silva was made the victim of a carjacking and buried in a shallow grave, and Muller quickly becomes one of many who vanish on suspect trips abroad. Whilst Oliviera does get off effectively scot-free from what is essentially a disaster, that's not his concern. China was his biggest exporter for the black market organs in the build-up to the walking plague, and with the slapdash morality of the people who sourced them, their means of acquisition may have been less than peaceful. If just 10 or even 1% of the shipments were infected, it could account for hundreds of concurrent outbreaks across the globe. Whilst Oliviera couldn't prove his concerns, nor would there be any post-war ability to do so, there is some precedent to this. A vast array of different pathogens have been transmitted by organ donation. And whilst the risk in a decent hospital is suggested to be only around 0.18%, all it can take is just one transmission to cause an outbreak. There have been some cases of outbreaks in diseases like tuberculosis, that are believed to have been started by organ donation. Obviously, official procedures have strict operating rules about who can and can't donate organs, as well as screening procedures, for this very reason. But we can clearly see mistakes can happen, and some can slip through the net. With Oliviera's black market rush jobs, there wasn't even time to test for pathogens like hepatitis, or even HIV, let alone an up-and-coming virus no one had ever heard of. So for Oliviera, he spends much of his time trying to recover from the scandal. Whilst he still managed to escape and survive, he wasn't aware of the true danger until it was clawing at his doorstep. 
In Barbados, we meet Jacob Anyati. Originally South African, he grew up in a township outside of Cape Town in the pre-war days. Despite the grinding poverty, he still looks back on the initial build-up to the crisis fondly. The night it all hit home for him, he had been making good tips at his job at the v waterfront, and the Springboks were smashing the All Blacks, enough to put a smile on any South African's face. Tired and heading home, Anyati became aware of gunfire. This wasn't so unusual growing up in the township, but it soon becomes clear this isn't just a gang row that got out of hand. The shots continue, and he smells smoke as a crowd forms, fleeing from the area. Refusing to leave his family, Inyati tries to wade through the crowd, but gets shoved through one of the makeshift buildings which promptly collapses on top of him. On breaking free, he sees the cause of the commotion, a group of ten or fifteen, silhouetted against the flames as they shamble towards him with outstretched arms. Nyati barely escapes just one of them, as the township dissolves into burning buildings and screams and grasping hands reaching from the smoke. He tries to help her mother and her children, but nothing he says can persuade her to leave her home, as she swings at him with a knife. Nyati still thinks of her. Sometimes in his dreams he sees them again, sometimes they're his own family. Seeing light ahead, Inyati rushes for it, coming into the open just as something slams into his shoulder and he's out cold before he even hits the ground. He comes to, full of morphine, in a hospital, having been shot in the shoulder by the police. Distantly, he hears doctors outside arguing about the disease, and whether or not it's rabies. This was the first major outbreak, and unfortunately one of the most important for setting the tone of the early days of the walking plague. Through multiple other people, we learn that the media caught wind of early events and labelled the disease African rabies, delivering a twofold strike as to how seriously the global north would take it. For one, it coupled it with another well-known disease that you can already get vaccinated against. Despite obviously being untrue and unrelated, those who actually believed early stories didn't believe it could be that bad. On top of that, it's made out to be exclusively African, as well as being used to lump and other multiple diverse countries to a single monolithic continent. It's also just viewed as not their problem. Terrifying as lethal tropical diseases may sound, they're far away, and thus not much of a concern for Europe or America. To many, even if it sounded scary, African rabies likely didn't sound any more imminent than Ebola, until it potentially became a threat to them. African rabies belongs to Africa, and it isn't for them to worry about. Only when it came to their shores was it a cause for concern, and by then the attitude built up to it and the waters muddied by misinformation meant that it was already too late. But there was some early effort to try and collect sincere information on the coming threat, Jürgen Warmbrunn is ex-Israeli intelligence, and first picked up that something may be going on trying to decode Chinese messages from Taiwan. Apparently, it had been a sloppy translation job, but upon reading them, it turns out the characters were transcribed just fine. It's just the messages that are unintelligible. They describe outbreaks of a virus that initially eliminates the host, then revives them as a frothing cannibal. Obviously, Warmbrun doesn't believe this at face value, rather insisting that it's a coded message for a new weapon or an upcoming war. He admits he never took them as true straight away, as who in their right mind would believe some translated stories about flesh-eating monsters. Later, at his daughter's wedding, he overhears stories from someone's cousin who went to Cape Town. After a shark cage diving trip went awry and said shark bit him on the arse, he was placed in Groot Schur Hospital, the same one as Jacob and Yati, and at the same time, exposing him to the same events. Warmbrun decides to take note of this, and compiles it with the Chinese messages to show his superiors. With China starting a faux war with Taiwan to cover up their increasingly severe outbreaks, Warmbrun digs and finds more of the past stories. He acquires the psychiatric reports of MacDonald and his team after their encounter in Kyrgyzstan and he finds the blog of Oliviera's nurse describing her Muller's attack on Dr. Silver. Steadily, he starts to piece together a story that maybe those first emails weren't incorrect at all, and something severe was about to breach over the horizon. Luckily though, knowledge is power, 
and he finds the surefire way to take down the infected by removing the head or destroying the brain. Warmbrun contacts a friend, Paul Knight, who's also been working on the same topic, and the two compile the resources along with 15 other personnel, of virologists, military strategists, and intelligence operatives, to create the influential Warmbrun Knight report. Everything needed to make sure the budding threat never reached a pandemic level. If it was read, and if it was then followed. But his own country of Israel did at least, and through Saladin Kader, we get a different perspective of how they implemented their resistance. Whilst Kader is now a professor of urban planning, pre-war he was still just in school, born and raised in Kuwait City. He was working a shift in Starbucks when Israel put their plan into action, undergoing a voluntary quarantine and offering asylum to any foreign-born Jew, foreigner of Israeli parents, and to the surprise of many, any Palestinian living in formerly occupied territories or on prior borders with Israel. Kader and his family were in the latter category, having fled to Kuwait in the Six-Day War in 1967. Kader and many others are rightfully suspicious of this, viewing it as a trap, and developing conspiracy theories that they plan to use Palestinians as human shields. Kader's father wasn't convinced, and worked as a janitor at a nearby hospital, being witness to its first outbreak of what was still known as African rabies, he decided on the same day to head to Israel and their offer of protection. Father and son argued. Kader believed this was the dawn of a new uprising and that African rabies was some foreign hoax. Whereas his father was certain of its danger, and whilst having no more love for Israel than his son, viewed them as the only nearby country actually making genuine preparations for the coming storm. Kader believes his father a coward, telling him that he's expecting a recruitment letter from a terror organisation, and proudly quoting the Quran to his father. After his father beats the snot out of him, and tells him he's leaving this room with his family or he's not leaving it alive, much of the martyrdom leaves Kader's body, and he cries most of the way to Cairo. With no direct flights to Israel, they were forced to fly to Cairo, take a bus through the desert, and then cross at the Taba border crossing. The wall being constructed only served to reinforce Kader's initial views. Surely this had to be a sign Israel were expecting an attack. And he was half right. The first cracks in his belief begin to appear as they pass the border. One by one, they had to walk through a gauntlet of cages containing huge, fierce dogs. An old man hobbles through first, and the dogs go berserk lunging and snapping at him through the cage. As he's hauled off to a suspicious black van, Kader believes they're weeding out the old and the weak. Kader and his family then pass by without incident, the dogs almost seeming friendly. But when a noisy American receives the same hostility from the dogs, he's hauled away to the same black van, especially when a bloody bandage is revealed around his chest. Prior to Kader's first thoughts, Race, age, and injury no longer seem relevant, and the sole pass mark to get in is the reaction from the dogs. Maybe the rabies thing wasn't so wrong after all. The family spend the next few weeks in miserable quarantine camps, being subject to tests for blood, skin, hair, saliva, and even urine and feces. After three weeks and a clean bill of health, their official documents barely even seem to matter, all that's seemingly important is their condition. They're given housing and a good job in Tel Aviv. And later, when boarding a bus to go, everything seems too good to be true. When they stop in Beersheba, the hammer falls. Kader is awoken by the bus crashing, and people screaming as the city around them becomes a war zone. Rushing to cover, they see it's civilians versus soldiers, and Kader is adamant the resistance has sprung at last. But finally seeing one of the civilian soldiers, it turns out it's an Israeli civil war. Whilst the true case was never really uncovered, the repatriation of Palestinians, the abandoning of occupied territories, and the evacuation of Jerusalem had inflamed sceptical civilians to the point of violent resistance. But all of Kader's beliefs go up in smoke as a rocket takes out one of the black vans seen at the border. From the flames the undead arise the fire seemingly having no effect. The soldiers light them up and the bullets are just as useless, as they pass harmlessly through their torsos, 
Only by aiming at the head do they finally succumb. At last it all clicks for Kader that the warnings are true, and the walking plague is coming, but the rest of the world doesn't seem to be listening. So, just what is this virus? How does it work? What's it called? Where did it come from? And if it's so lethal, why hasn't all of humanity been devoured before in far less technologically advanced times? The given name to the virus is Solanum, although it also became known by the common names of the Blight, the Walking Plague, or African Rabies. It enters the body via the bloodstream, typically via a bite, passes the blood-brain barrier, and then replicates in the frontal lobe, destroying the cells in the process and shutting down the other major organs of the host, killing them. Once the virus has saturated and mutated the brain, it reanimates the rest of the body, with some bodily functions remaining essentially similar to pre-infection, like the usage of muscles, some in a modified capacity like sensory organs, and the remainder are permanently shut down, like most of the other organs. The new being is now what we would call a zombie. And unlike a human, its brain can function completely anaerobically, through unknown means. Although it could be an explanation for why zombies still decay, despite solanum saturation repelling other microbiotic life. It's hard to say exactly what type of virus solanum may be, as it impacts the body vastly different to many other viruses, and is likely very evolutionarily distinct, whatever it is. Despite being spread by bites, it has a markedly different effect on the body to rabies, and one could instead cautiously suggest it as a very derived orthoflavor virus. These have a central African origin, as do many hominid diseases, and some, like Zika, reproduce in the brain as well. Orthoflavor viruses are typically spread via invertebrate vectors though, which is impossible in solanum. So if this is the case, at some point the virus cut out the middleman of a vector altogether. When bitten by a zombie, within the first hour a human experiences pain and discoloration of the wound, as well as immediate clotting. Five hours in and they experience severe flu-like symptoms, with chills, fevers, nausea, dementia and joint pain. By hour eight, the extremities and bite wound are numb. Both the fever and dementia have significantly worsened and the patient begins to suffer a loss of muscular coordination. Hour 11 sees paralysis in the lower body, complete numbness and a slowed heart rate, with the patient slipping into a coma by hour 16. 20 hours after the initial bite, the patient would be considered medically deceased, with heart failure and zero brain activity. Three hours later, reanimation occurs. Solanum is completely fatal to all living things, but reanimation only occurs in human beings, and the virus seems to be specialised to hominids. In the case of Herr Muller, death and reanimation was suggested to happen quicker due to it being from an organ transplant and not a bite. Animals and parasites of any kind instinctively fear and avoid reanimated humans, and this is why the reanimated have such surprisingly long lifespans. Only a small handful of saprobiotic organisms will continue to eat a solanum-saturated body leading to a very slow decay of typically multiple years. It's also why Israel was able to use dogs to detect the zombie threat in bitten civilians. Zombie forms are incapable of cellular regeneration, or any real metabolic function outside of the brain, so they will degrade over time with movement and erosion. Hot, humid climates also speed this process. Behaviorally, the reanimated only seek to consume the living, and will eat any other animal life, albeit with a strong preference for humans ostensibly to spread the virus. Despite this, there is no chemical processing of anything consumed, and the zombies can't benefit from it, but will continue to eat until the point of rupture. They will also reject carrion any older than 12 to 18 hours. They're incapable of emotion or registering physical sensations, and respond only to basic sensory stimuli. No attempts at reasoning or logic seem present, and zombies are roughly on par with an ant in terms of intellect. The one sign of any communal behaviour is the moan, which attracts other zombies when one of them sees prey, which is also the reason for the human muscular diaphragm still being in use. Physically, a zombie can only use the base tools given to it by its host, and even this is blighted by poor coordination and rigor mortis. They're incapable of running, 
and their speed is determined by the stride length of the person they once were. They're only as strong as their host too, although they never tire at the cost of wearing down their own body with no ability to recover. Only one in four retain the dexterity to even climb a ladder, already diminishing one of Homo sapiens' most important attributes. This also makes them essentially incapable of tool use, even if they did have the brain power to engage with tools. But what's the deal with the slow zombie, and why do they eat people when this seems counterintuitive to what a virus would want? And a lot of this may stem from the later circumstances that outbreaks occurred in, and how the virus uses the ingredients of the human body as best it can. In other viruses spread by biting, chiefly lysa viruses like rabies, the hosts are ones which bite to either defend themselves or show aggression, mammals like rodents or carnivorans. Areas of the temporal lobe like the hippocampus and amygdala are targeted to encourage bites and so the virus spreads. And similarly, tumours or electrical stimulation in the temporal lobe can turn otherwise mild-mannered people to homicidal rages. In mice, changes to the amygdala increase the predatory behaviours in two ways, one for pursuit and one for the biting and subjugation of prey. It's possible that the former part of the amygdala may be utilised by solanum to pursue any living thing it perceives, and zombies are recorded trying to pursue animals too. But for humans, the latter part of biting wouldn't work. Humans defend themselves or attack with either blows from the forelimbs or picking up tools to use as weapons. So solanum can't rely on spiking the temporal lobe to spread itself in a population due to its specified host and it seems the only way it can rely on the body to do so is to trick it into thinking humans are food, the only reliable way to get a human to bite and gnaw on something. So on top of this, it presumably damages the ventromedial nucleus of the hypothalamus, and the vagus nerve, meaning that zombies never feel full, and so can be relied on to continually keep trying to eat people, even after their stomachs have burst. But with that said... It's likely to be rare over much of Solanum's occupation of Earth that a zombie ever got to eat a human in its entirety, or indeed that a true undead horde developed. Many diseases don't want to wipe their hosts out, and Solanum is no exception. Considering Solanum has likely been around since the late Pleistocene slash Middle Paleolithic at least, it presumably evolved as a hominid specialised virus used to the group sizes of Paleolithic people who lived at far lower densities than today, and likely in flexibly sized wide-ranging groups. A zombie or zombies can't be too competent, or instead they'll just kill and eat intended hosts before they can reanimate. So zombies likely persisted partly through their ineptitude, being tough enough to withstand environmental conditions, but not powerful enough to singly catch and overpower healthy humans only really ever managing to get the occasional bite in to spread the virus, which could then spread itself in communities when the bitten and sickened individual reanimated among their caring communities, likely getting at least one more bite in before they were restrained or neutralised. As human groups came together and then split apart, attack opportunities grew and shrank and bitten individuals travel and spread the virus further. The notion of a zombie horde is effectively an invention of sedentary, high-density human civilizations. In early modern humans, hordes never likely got the chance to grow to that size, and the virus persisted in solitary bites spread between social groups, persisting among the people. As the initial spread shows, Solanum's speed and success was due to globalization and high densities of modern humans, and Solanum itself was almost a casualty of globalization too never accounting for the 21st century lifestyles, and almost threatening to destroy itself and its target species by rendering them both extinct in coming events. But humans had still settled in considerable densities of tens of thousands long before the events of the zombie war. How had there never been big outbreaks before? And there had. The first believed instance of a record of a zombie comes from a cave in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Thirteen skulls were found crushed, with a pile of ash being all that was left of the bodies. A cave painting on the wall shows a menacing human with its arms raised in a threatening manner. In its gaping mouth is another human. Whilst this is disputed by some, it is likely a genuine article of an early Solanum outbreak, considering the virus almost certainly preceded agricultural development. 
The first fully verified incident comes from 3000 BC in ancient Egypt, where a nondescript tomb was found holding a withered body with a bite mark on the right radius. Scratches covered every wall that forensic examination revealed were made over several years. The frontal lobe was destroyed, and traces of solanum were found in the body. It's been debated if the presence of zombies could have influenced Egyptian views on the afterlife, and burial preparations like removing the brain. But other ancient cultures may well have been the things standing in Solanum's way for creating a far larger outbreak. As well as other records from China, Central Africa, and Afghanistan, one record comes from Scotland, 121 AD, the height of everyone's favourite empire, the Romans. Whilst the initial cause of the outbreak was unknown, local chieftains sent some 3,000 of their warriors to stamp out what was simply believed to be madness and aberrant behaviour. 600 were outright devoured, and the bulk of the rest returned to an undead horde. A local Roman merchant who witnessed part of the battle but escaped reported to his nearest commander, Marcus Lucius Terentius, that beheaded zombies no longer seemed to be a threat. With a horde of now over 9,000 approaching from less than a day away, Terentius ordered his garrison of 480 men to dig trenches seven foot deep, to make a funnel where no more than 300 zombies could stand abreast, then filling the trenches with crude oil that was ignited as the zombies approached. In a battle lasting the better part of a day, the zombies were beheaded and both head and body burned. The Romans suffered 150 casualties, but vanquished the entire horde. Anyone bitten was well aware of their fate, and also accepted their own destruction. Following this, the Emperor Hadrian called for all known intel on zombies to be compiled into a single volume, known only as Army Order 37, that was then distributed to every legion in the Empire. Following this, there were still outbreaks in Algeria, France, and Germany, that were swiftly and efficiently put down. There was no fear or superstition when it came to the undead. They were just another problem to be dealt with in the most effective way as per official instructions. With the spread of the Roman Empire across the Old World and its success in combating the undead, it's quite possible the Roman Empire was a significant factor in suppressing Solanum's spread and other outbreaks for some time until the dissolution of the Roman Empire. Solanum wasn't officially recorded in the New World until 1554 AD, when a conquistador's party was eaten by a horde of zombies searching for El Dorado, although the royal court and the Vatican didn't believe him, and stripped him of his title for recording the incident. One later record gives some grim insight as to how it may have been spread there, describing an entire slave ship with everyone abducted on board, having been bitten and turned. Solanum's appearance in the New World coinciding what was called the Age of Discovery likely isn't a coincidence, and is just one of endless negative impacts likely brought over by colonial Europeans, ultimately setting the stage centuries in advance for the global catastrophe to come. Thanks for watching, and thanks especially to my patrons Phenomenon, The Super Stupor, Sam Burgo, Sonam Blobsong, K Sandom, Bigal, Erengar Steiny, Flygon's Archives, Hui Hui, Original Username, Tristan Berry, Evely, Howleth, Archazor Queen, Seth Fake Last Name, Zaysa, Dodekablos, and Bazugazu Bachohatsu Bachomatsu for their ongoing kindness keeping things going. Thanks too to Seal Sorceress on Tumblr for creating the excellent cave painting artwork too. For more of their original pieces, be sure to follow them on Tumblr at the link provided in the description. Thanks too to Monster Legacy's David Sparder for creating the additional line art for the latter half of this video too. Some of you may already be aware of his blog on movie monsters, but if not, be sure to check it out after this with it being linked in the description. This may seem like an odd choice for a video and indeed a series from me, but at the end of the day, it's as simple as it's my YouTube channel and I get to pick the hyperfixation. I love Max Brooks' writing, and it was actually a pretty notable inspiration for the channel as a whole. No one has really spoken much on his books on YouTube, and so I decided to plug that gap. So we'll have to see how well it goes. Zombies, in general, are now the media equivalent of pulled pork, typically slathered on top of existing properties as an optional extra and very rarely their own dish nowadays. But World War Z comes from a time when they were still the sole focus of quality content. 
For my usual viewers, I do have some Monster Hunter stuff planned for before this series is done in April, and luckily afterwards it's back to business as usual. If any of you watched this, of course. For everyone else, if you liked what you saw and enjoy breakdowns of other fictitious monsters, albeit of a more zoological flavour, then do look through the rest of my videos. There may be something you like. And if there is, please consider subscribing. If you just enjoyed this one, please do consider liking it and sharing it with others. For videos outside my usual wheelhouse, it would help them gain some traction if shown to others who may like them. The rest of the chapters I intend to upload every two weeks. And obviously some records will be more abridged or expanded upon than others, depending on the content. Hopefully I'll see you there for some of them.